Hello and welcome to today's recording. In this recording, I'm going to talk about a new tool that you could use to estimate the cost of Elastic Cache serverless based on a workload that is already running on Elastic Cache provision service. My name is Steven Hans, and I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS. First, I'm going to review the pricing model for the provisioned Elastic Cache. Then I'm going to have a review of Elastic Cache serverless pricing model. Then I'm going to compare the serverless versus provisioned pricing model from a capacity perspective, capacity planning, which capacity, of course, translates into cost. Then I'm going to review the cost estimator tool, what it does, how it works, and then a quick demo of it. So let's review the pricing model of Elastic Cache instance based. Elastic Cache instance based is what you call a pay per hour pricing. Basically, you select an instance type and you pay a flat fee per hour usage. Of course, this depends on how many instances you select and the size of the instance and the capacity of it. The bigger the instance, the more capacity it has, the cost is going to go up. You do have an option to use a free tier, a T2 micro. But regardless of the instance type and regardless of the usage, the price is a flat fee. Once you select an instance, that's your fee. You could reduce this cost if you select the reserved instance, which is basically a long-term commitment when you commit a one or three year commitment to use the service, and then we're gonna pass down some of the savings to you. There's no additional fee, just the hourly fee. You might incur additional networking fee from your application side. That depends on which availability zone your application is located in relation to where Elastic Cache is running. So this is called cross AZ charge. Let's see the pricing of Elastic Cache Serverless. Elastic Cache Serverless, on the other hand, is something called a pay-per-use pricing. What this means that depending on how much of the service you use, that is you're going to pay for it. So it does not have a flat fee. And it's broken into two dimensions if you pay, if you will. First, you pay for the storage, i.e. the amount of data that you store in Elastic Cache. By the way, this data is in memory in Elastic Cache at all times and the price is $0.125 per gigabyte hours for the first gigabyte. It's prorated after that. The second dimension is how much work you do. We call this Elastic Cache Processing Units or eCPU units. And the way it works, it's every one kilobyte of data rounded up to the first kilobyte is considered an eCPU. So if you send one kilobyte, receive one kilobyte, or you execute a Lua script on the server, where you interact with one kilobyte of data, that is one processing unit. And the pricing is $0.0034 per 1 million eCPUs. So if you put this in a different perspective, one gigabyte of storage would cost you about $90 a month, and 10,000 eCPUs of one kilobyte each, 10,000 eCPUs a second per every minute of every hour, that will add up to another $90 a month. So that would be your total cost. And of course, if you do less work, it's gonna cost you less. And if you do more work, it's gonna cost you more. The storage price is calculated as a total storage, regardless of how many shards or how many hosts are being used. In fact, it's completely transparent to the user. So let's compare the two services, provisioned versus serverless, from a capacity perspective, and capacity always translates into cost. Now, what you see here is the impact of provisioning. Um, if your workload is a steady workload that it always works around the same parameters, there are no spikes in the workload, then you could pick the very appropriate instance type and be always fully set to the right pricing model, to the right capacity. However, if your workload is not 100% predictable and it's not a steady workload, it has something called spikes in it, a spiky workload, like the example here, it is quite possible that the allocated capacity, I'm talking about instance based, that the allocated capacity, it's over provisioned. So in this case, as you can see, the blue line is the provision capacity for most of the time it's over provisioned. That means it's basically you're paying for capacity that you're not really using. On the other hand, there are occasions when there are spikes in the workload and there's not enough capacity. In that case, the workload is going to suffer because there's not enough capacity to meet the demand. That's why 
capacity planning is not necessarily easy. You must have uh, elaborate monitoring in place. You have to adjust the thresholds, not just to have the capacity planning in place and monitor it, but you have to have the right thresholds for your workload as it changes. Of course, all this depends that you've selected the correct instance, instance type. Now, Elastic Cache Provision does support auto-scaling for a couple of instance types, but you have to set up the monitoring and you have to set up the thresholds for them, especially beyond the basic CPU and uh, memory utilizations. You have to set it up and the scaling may not be as fast as you might think. Hardware has to be acquired, configured, and added to the cluster. On the other hand, Elastic Cache Serverless, you basically have no capacity. You're not committing to any capacity. You just pay per usage. So of course you have nothing to monitor because we monitor the workload for you. And uh, as you need more capacity, we're going to add that. As, as far as, far as uh, uh, monitoring, we actually monitor the networking as well. So not just CPU and memory consumption, but networking as well. It's often possible that your workload just requires more network bandwidth, not necessarily that it requires more storage or CPU. Also, the scaling is much faster in Elastic Cache Serverless because it uses a different architecture, different environment that is implemented to, to run it for you that can scale much faster. So let's just look at the cost estimator. The cost estimator is nothing else but the script that you run against your existing workload. You download a Python script from GitHub and you run it on an EC2. The EC2 obviously needs connectivity, but not necessarily to your cluster. It's all just going to retrieve metadata description of your cluster and CloudWatch metrics. So that's all what it needs access to. It's not accessing your database or the data in it whatsoever. And once it's executed, it conveniently displays the information for you on the screen and it stores it in a file in a CSV format so that you could use that for later analysis if you wish. Here's a screen capture of a typical output. Well, maybe not typical because this cluster hasn't done anything, but this is for a purpose. I just want to go over what it does. So at the top in the, in the yellow rectangle, there's a summary where it's going to tell you what, in which region the cluster was located that it ran on. What was the name of the cluster, the start and end times, the primary node and the read replica that it used to extract data from, and the general topology of the cluster, as in how many nodes are in it, how many primary nodes, and how many read replicas. Now you have to keep in mind that this tool is going to examine one primary node and one read replica. So there's an assumption made here that your data is distributed evenly and the workload is also distributed evenly. Now, if your workload is not distributed evenly or the data is not distributed evenly, this assumption is not going to be accurate. And the reason for that is that it's not feasible to examine each, every one of the nodes to calculate the consumption, storage consumption, and eCPU consumption on each one of them. So it's just one primary node and one read replica to extrapolate the work. The first column is going to be the total size. This is calculated based on how many primary nodes are there. And then uh, the eval, evaluate eCPU. This is how many uh, eCPUs were used to run Lua scripts on the server. The primary in eCPU is calculated how much data is going into the cluster because data can only go in via the primary nodes. And the primary node out and the read replica out is how much data is coming out of the cluster. And the last three columns is just a summary, a summary of the storage cost, the summary of the eCPU cost, and the total cost per hour. The result is broken down hour per hour for one day. Now let me see if I could run the demo for you. There's a help option. If you execute the script, the, you will see that uh, you have to enter the region name, the cluster name, and a day range. By default is one day. So it's going to pick information from CloudWatch metrics for the past 24 hours. And the last one is the output file name. It's optional. If you don't provide one, one will be generated for you. And it's called cost estimate with the cluster name in it and the date in it, a CSV format. Let me clear the screen and run it. I have a test cluster here that I created some workloads on it. So the output, the initial output is the familiar, familiar output with the cluster name times. And you can see that I just generated some workload in the last hour. 
and you will see that there was about 1.4 million reads from the primary node and 1.4 million read from the, uh, the read replica. And uh, there were about uh, close to 300,000 writes. When you add this up, this comes out to about $0.106. And this is added up to the storage cost. Actually, I executed about 3 million requests on this cluster with about 10% of that 300,000 rewrites and 90% reads. So this is the correct estimation, even though it was just executed uh, across all the nodes, we just estimated, calculation was estimated based on one primary node and one read replica. Now with this, uh, that the demo has completed, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. And uh, here is the access to the code. If you'd like to download the code from GitHub, there's the QR code, or you can enter the location from the link below. If you'd like to learn more about this tool or any other tools, you're welcome to contact me or contact my team at the email provided here. Thank you.